So to me, you know, I fairly early on established a pretty simple set of guiding principles. And I brought those guiding principles with me from Merck to Amgen, where I went after I'd been at Merck for about five years. Uh, and, and they were just these. I said, look, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to focus on grievous illness. That may seem simple. You'd say, of course, you're a pharmaceutical company. What else are you going to do? But it's amazing how often people lose their way and end up spending all of their time taking, trying to make modest improvements in existing therapies try and take a drug that's given three times a day and give it once a day. Well, those are good things. You know, they too serve who do that. But, you know, we're going to focus on grievous illness and try and make some real progress here. So that's the first thing. And the second thing we're going to do is we're really going to focus on the task, not the tool. So if you're sitting in a traditional pharmaceutical company, this was true before, it's not true any longer, well, it's not as much true, but if you're sitting in a traditional pharmaceutical com company, if, 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 um, if Brian, you and I were to go and visit a traditional pharmaceutical company, certainly in the, in the mid-90s, we would walk around the campus and eventually somebody would walk up to us and say, you know, biologists don't make drugs, chemists make drugs. And that's, that's really focusing on the tool, right? So you say, uh, what is the target that I can approach for this disease uh, that I can address with a potent, orally bioavailable, once daily, highly selective molecule that I can manufacture in Singapore and put in a blister pack. You know, what, what is that target? To me, that's not the question. The question is, what is the target? Let's not talk about how we have to address it. I don't really care about that. Because if I have a target that's really worthwhile and can affect some horrible disease, I don't care if you have to approach it with a cell-based therapy or a protein or an infectious therapy, I don't care what it is, first show me the target. They're so rare. They're so unusual. You know, for all of the antibiotics that we have, and there are many hundreds of them, there are only about six targets. Because there really aren't very many things that you can do to kill bacteria or stop them from growing where the reversion rate for bacteria isn't so fast that they just quickly, you know, are no longer sensitive. No, I mean, it's just it's so rare. And it always has to be something that involves many components, cell wall synthesis, protein synthesis. Those are the only places you can get away with it. And, and, and so it's very difficult to find targets. That's just one example. It's even worse when you talk about targets in the human being rather than in a bacteria. So let's focus on the tool, on the task, not the tool. We can worry about tools later. If you're going to do that right, though, that means that you have to bring together everyone with their different backgrounds, chemical engineers uh, on the one hand, physiologists on the other, and get them to speak a common language. And I guess if I'm proud of anything that I've done over the years in industry, it's that. It's bringing together people to do that. Let's speak with a common language and understand what we're trying to do. The, the third guiding principle was do the experiment in people. And, and that really has two parts. Um, the, the first part is to do an experiment. Uh, people, scientists, amazingly, lose track of the scientific method pretty easily. Actually, they go, they go rogue pretty easily. And, and they end up doing studies where they just accumulate information. You know, but data is not understanding. In, in order to actually understand what's going on in a human physiologic process, we actually have to study humans, right? I've argued that human beings are an appropriate object for study for a human therapeutics company. My experience running an animal health unit was if the experimental subject is a chicken and the patient is a chicken, it works really well. But if the experimental subject is a chicken and the patient is a human, that's not so good. So you really have to get to the point fairly quickly where you can safely do a study in humans. And you have an ethical responsibility to actually show you can do that safely. But you need to get there quickly because the human organism is really quite a bit different from other organisms. And when you do that, you have another ethical responsibility, and that is to actually do an experiment. Because so often what happened in the industry years ago was, hmm, I have this compound and it seems to work in this rabbit model, 
when the compound uh, reaches concentrations of 100 nanomolar in the blood. So let's take it into humans at 100 nanomolar and see what happens. Well, that's not really an experiment. I mean, what you're doing is collecting observations that are associated with a certain drug concentration in a human population. But if it doesn't work, and it almost never does, right? Almost never do you put a compound into people and say, ah, oh, look at that, it works. It never works. Probably the success is so low that you're just about never going to succeed. So what you need to do is actually demonstrate that you tested hypothesis, that you hit the relevant target in the relevant tissue, did what you said you were going to do molecularly, and then it didn't work. And then, you know, job well done. You can take that target and move it aside because it's not important for that disease process. If you can't do that experiment, I will not take that drug into people. I just will not do it. Because to me, it's, it, it, there's an ethical concern. You don't use people as guinea pigs unless you can actually get something out of it. Right? And, and you, have to, you have that responsibility. So to me, that was extremely important. And the last guiding principle relevant to these others was, was to integrate the efforts of everyone, not just the scientists, but the people who come from the commercial side, the legal side. Everyone has to get together in order to, I referred to, used to refer to it as a seamless integration process. If I don't have the right intellectual property attorneys working with me, we can never characterize what we've done. We just can't. And so if I can't get them, if they're not in the room, I don't know what I'm doing. And similarly, I found from my experience as a physician that patients didn't tell me the truth. It wasn't anything bad on their part. It was only good things. Right? It was because they want me to feel better. Right? So, so the experience is this. This happened to me when I was on the Bristol Myers Scientific Advisory Board. The experience was, well, Bristol Myers was interested in the question, having developed the first angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor, was there a reason to make angiotensin receptor blockers? And they would do the same thing in principle. So was there a reason? So I was asked to lead this discussion, and I gathered together all my learned academic cardiology colleagues, and we had a good discussion. And at the end of this discussion, which was in, held in, uh, in Princeton, um, one of the vice presidents in the sales organization got up and said, Dr. Perlmutter, that was really fascinating. I learned an enormous amount from that. Thank you very much. But I think you kind of missed the point, because um, it's really all about the cough. Now, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors have a mechanism-based adverse effect. They make you cough. We know how that works. And we, academic practitioners, had always said, well, you know, so you're going to cough for a little while, it'll be okay. You can. What actually happens is, you know, I go into my patient, I say, well, Mr. Johnson, how are you doing on your new ACE inhibitor? Great, doc. It's really great. It's making a big difference for me. I feel like I've got a lot more energy. I can do a lot more. What really happened was he took one pill, started coughing, and he threw the rest of flushed the rest down the toilet. That's what happened. But he doesn't want me to feel badly that I prescribed this drug for him that didn't work, so he tells me that it's actually working. That's what happens. And I said, well, you know, if I'm going to actually make drugs that make a meaningful difference for people, I better know what the sales force knows. It's all about the cough. Right? If I don't know that, I'm not doing anything. So that's just an example of how you have to integrate the information from all sources. So those are the guiding principles that I learned, hard-won lessons, even though they sound simple, um, while I was at Merck that I brought to Amgen and that proved to be, I think, in retrospect, a pretty successful set of guiding principles for, for building that organization.